Welcome to Digital Asset News, take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got two stories that go deep. First of all, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund chief, says pandemic will unleash the worst recession since the Great Depression. Also, a beautiful article written by Andrew Rosau. The pandemic couldn't have provided a better environment for crypto, and this just has a vast depth of knowledge, and we're going to go pretty deep on this one, but it's going to be well worth it. And finally, we're going to go over the scam of the day. We'll do that at the very end, but let's break into today's stories. First up, what do we got? Let's take a look at CoinMarketCap, uh, or Binance Market Cap, as I like to call it, because it was bought by Binance for a cool $400 million. So. Hats off to CoinMarketCap for selling out. I mean, not selling out, but selling their product to Binance. Look, if someone's gonna come to me and go, I'm gonna buy your whatever 400 million, I'm probably gonna sell too. Anyhow, so we've got Bitcoin. Uh, this looks, let me refresh this, this doesn't look right. Ah, there we go. So uh, yeah, we've got quite a slump today. Uh, Bitcoin down 5%, Ethereum 6, XRP. And then the darling of the last week or so, Bitcoin SV and Bitcoin Cash down tremendously because their halves, halvings are over. Uh, Bitcoin Cash was a couple days ago, Bitcoin SV did their halving yesterday, and I expect a massive drop. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you think Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV are going to uh, pump, or totally get obliterated over the next weeks and months. Uh, let me know. But that's what's going on today. And in the traditional markets, uh, let's see. It is Friday, April 10th, around 4 p.m. Mountain Time. And just like a sawtooth pattern. And it looks like the previous close was 27.49. And right now we are at 27.82. So it looks like the traditional markets staying strong, amazingly. Let's break into today's stories. So first up, the International Monetary Fund chief says a pandemic will unleash the worst recession since the Great Depression. And uh, this is from the managing director, Kristalina Georgieva. She states that the, uh, the pandemic sweeping the world, the coronavirus, which for some reason people are so afraid to stay on YouTube videos, I don't understand, I don't care, that's what it is, will turn global economic growth sharply negative in 2020, triggering the worst fallout since the 1930s Great Depression. Ouchie. With only a partial recovery seen in 2021, the head of the International Monetary Fund said. And uh, she also paints a bleaker picture, noting that governments had already undertaken a fiscal stimulus measuring of $8 trillion, but more would likely be needed. I mean, imagine $8 trillion, and we might not even be uh, really getting into the brunt of it. So there's going to be a lot more needed, a lot more efforts, a lot more money, a lot more everything to combat this awful, uh, the COVD-19, which is just uh, unbelievable. It's amazing how things can change in 30 days, 60 days, 120 days. Just amazing. Anyhow, she states that just three months ago, we expected positive per capita income growth in over 160 out of their 170 plus member countries. And this is in 20, this has been right now. Today, that number has been turned on its head, she states. We now project that over 170 countries will experience negative per capita income growth this year. So out of their 170, 160 are gonna be in the down the tubes. If the pandemic faded in the second half of the year, the IMF expected a partial recovery in 2021, Georgieva said, but she warned the situation could also get worse. So she's saying that if we break out of this pandemic, if for some way the global community responds and we've got an, enough testing, we figure out uh, the different antibodies that will allow people to go back to work, uh, the social distancing program, not only we know it works, but we're able to cut back on it. If we can do all these things and kind of get the economy back in motion, then we'll still not see a recovery until uh, early 2021. If things go longer, if we start to see uh, the coronavirus just kick up again, because remember, uh, in North America, we are entering into our our summer. Unfortunately, into the Southern Hemisphere, uh, South America, Australia, they're entering into their um, winter. So we don't know how this is all going to play out, but uh, hopefully we hope for the best, uh, plan for the worst. Moving on. The IMF, which has 189 member countries, 
will release its detailed world economic outlook forecast on Tuesday. That's going to be big. Expect that to dictate what happens to the market. When I start to do forecasts, start to see earning losses, start to see unemployment rates grow, um, you could see major downturns to the market, but could, who knows, could be the opposite, I don't know. Georgieva said the pandemic was hitting both rich and poor countries, many in Africa, Asia, and Latin America were at higher risk because they had weaker health systems, which is just awful. And they're also unable to implement social distancing in their densely populated cities and poverty-stricken slums. Uh, she also said investors had already removed from some $100 billion in capital from those economies, more than three times the outflow seen during the same period of the global financial crisis. And this is what it, what it really comes down to as far as like, well, how does this relate to cryptocurrency? Well, obviously, this all relates to cryptocurrency. But I can tell you this, if you have these major players, these institutions, uh, these hedge funds, these whoever, and they are they are investing in emerging economies, and they say, wait, we have this pandemic, it's gonna, be, it's gonna grow so slow, we have to pull it out now. Maybe that's what happened. They just pulled their money out, like she said right here, 100 billion in capital, and they put it into the traditional market, which is why we may be seeing these types of pumps in the traditional market on top of the stimulus packages, packages, plural, that are being implemented. And that could also be spilling over into the cryptocurrency digital asset market because they are hedging their bet against the uh, traditional markets. I'm not sure, but it would stand to reason. Uh, moving on. She states, the IMF was created for times like these and stood ready to, to deploy its $1 trillion in lending capacity, Georgieva said. I'm kind of a cynic, um, if you guys haven't uh, realized that by now, but I'm not very... I can always see uh, some, some cloudiness you know, on the horizon. And when I see someone like the Inter International Monetary Fund go, hey, we're ready to deploy our $1 trillion in lending capacity, to me it says, are you lending that at... 0% interest? Or are you lending that at 1%, 0.5%, 2%? Or what are you doing with that? And how is that going to create more global debt? Now, it could be a nice gesture. Maybe that's uh, giving it away, but that's not what she's saying here. I mean, we had, I mean, who's going to give away a trillion dollars? Come on. I mean, you got Jack Dorsey over on Twitter. He just uh, uh, pledged $1 billion dollars uh, to help with the coronavirus effort. So hats off to him. That's a great thing. Good job. But uh, we have the, the IMF going, hey, we can lend this to you. Eh, but uh, it's, it's a lending capacity. That's about it. And lastly, uh, for the states to further aid the poorest countries, the fund, the World Bank, we're urging creditors such as China and other countries to temporarily stop collecting debt payments on their bilateral loans. So we'll see. Uh, I know that China has a uh, they have uh, they bought up a trillion dollars of debt for the America, so we'll see if they're like, eh, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll get you later. That'll be interesting. What do you? What are your thoughts? This will be the most interesting part. What are your thoughts? Tell me what you think is going to happen in the comments below. But this article directly brings us into the next. I mean, very well written article, and I cannot say enough about uh, Andrew Rossow. And when I read this, I was like, who the heck is this guy? So I took a look, and Andrew Rossow, and I'm probably saying his name wrong is a millennial attorney. I don't know why I had to throw the millennial in there, but whatever. Law professor, entrepreneur, writer, and speaker on privacy, cybersecurity, AR, AR, VR, blockchain, and digital monies. He has written for many outlets, contributed to cybersecurity, technical publication, uses a millennial background to its fullest potential. He provides a well-rounded perspective on social media. Great. So I was like, wow, all right. I can see now why this guy wrote a pretty great article. Uh, lawyers tend to be very loquacious and able to write down uh, fantastic briefs and things. So let's get into this article. And I got to tell you, hats off to you. I'm going to have to file, follow this guy on Twitter. Very good. So he states in the opening paragraph, the Fed opening the floodgates to unlimited standing. Quantitative easing paired with a $6 trillion stimulus package is an unprecedented event. It's the most heavy-handed intervention by the Fed to date. For many crypto proponents, it is a rallying cry amid an interventionist monetary policy reminiscent of the 2008 environment that led to the release of the Bitcoin white paper by its anonymous founder. I read that, I go, this is going to be a good article. So quantitative easing is the big bad uh, enemy in the room, or the big, the 5,000-pound grill in the room. And... There was a, a video I watched. It was talking about QA or QE, quantitative easing, and the middle class taxpayer and how they need to bail out the big companies. Um, 
and and they talk about this and it, and when I was when I was reading this, I'm like, when is everybody going to just snap and just go, you know what, enough's enough because we're sick of paying taxes when all you guys do is take the taxes and give it to these big companies and then we get screwed out. So I was listening to that was from Valuetainment. That's isn't it? Valuetainment. And uh, this gentleman here, he had economist Daniel DiMartino on. And just a couple minutes or so, um, just the way that they, they talked about it just made a ton of sense. So take a listen. Tell me what you think. I just think this approach, we're taking a loan for a loan for a loan for a loan for a loan. I mean, when does it ever end? So the argument then becomes about the taxpayer who's pissed off and saying, let me get this straight. You can constantly bail yourself out and you can constantly go print money with this quantitative easing. Why the hell do I have to pay taxes? Why do I pay taxes? Tell if you can, and I know this goes to your argument with the socialism, but why do I pay taxes? It's slightly different than the concept of socialism because socialism is to give me stuff. Right. But why do I pay taxes? That's right. For my big 40th birthday lunch, there were at the time that I had lunch with Richard Fisher, who was my boss, there were riots in the streets of Athens. And we ended that lunch with me saying, what's your greatest concern? And his answer was, I worry that Fed policy is going to eventually land us in the same spot as where Greece finds itself back then with riots in the streets. Now, take my example of the state of Illinois. You're, you're a Chicagoan. Your 401k has been decimated because you're one of millions of Americans who've been told to keep your money in the stock market no matter what. And there's, there's, there's no other school of thought. You've got countless investment advisors all giving the identically same advice to all of America. So you're Joe Q 401k holder and you're pissed off and you've lost a good chunk of your savings and you know you're going to have to tack at least another decade onto your work life to make up for what you've lost. Yeah, so what she just what she just said about there about that people it's been ground into their brain to invest, 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 put it in the stock market, don't take it out, it's gonna be fine. Well, when you take a look at the S and P, I mean, let's just take a look, just the S and P, not the Dow, just S and P. You know, the top 500 uh, companies that uh, it's just an index that measures the the performance of the 500 biggest companies. So what we're looking at this and we're seeing what's going on. So like, if we take a look at the five day, and okay, so it went down, went up. Okay, well that's great for some people, right? In the last five days, they've they've made some money. Let's take a look at the last month. Well, okay, you know they, they lost a little bit, but you know it rebounded. But this is where it gets a little funny. Let's say six months. Let's say you were just putting in right here. Let's say one year. Let's say five years. Can you see this nice big fat trend right here? And you're just putting money in, putting money in, putting in, because that's what you've been told to do. And then all of a sudden, big dips, da -da -da, and then dips, and then up. And then, oh, well, we'll rebound. We'll rebound and just leave it in there and it'll be okay. And you know what? At some point, of course, it will come back. It will be okay. But all these different bailouts that are happening right down here, I mean, they're happening right now, these are going into companies and the same thing that happened now is what happened in 2008. They get these bailouts and what do they do? They put it right back into their company. They buy their stocks. It's a buyback and then it pumps up the price artificially and then people are like, well, what's going to happen until the next one? Well, we're just going to tax you and then uh, we're just going to give it back to the big company. So when is it going to snap? When is it going to stop? Let's keep listening. Now, the city of Chicago has just bailed out its pension again. So you're told that your property taxes and your state income taxes are going to have to rise to pay for it. Let's just say Social Security and Medicare run out of money. So you're also told by the great people in Washington that your federal taxes are going to have to go up as well. So you're bailing out the pensioners. You're bailing out the federal government. You're bailing out corrupt state politicians and unions who Not have stop. who have given way too much more than than they could ever afford to pay for. And your next door neighbor's a fireman who's living great, and he's set for life. These are the seeds of social unrest in this country. You can only drive so big of a wedge between the haves and the have-nots especially when you're gutting out the middle class in the process. If you make very, very little in America today, and I'm talking about today, 25% of the 
of Americans who qualify for unemployment insurance are going to make more money in the second quarter than they would if they had not lost their job. That's how big unemployment, that's how big the stimulus bill is by taxing. Say that one more time. Say that one more time. So the stimulus bill tax on $600 for every American, what they get paid by collecting unemployment insurance. So 25% of Americans who are going to be out of the workforce okay. are going to make more in the second quarter, April, May, and June, than they would have had they kept their job. So if you make very little in America today, you're going to get through this. If you're worth a ton of money, you'd long since gone to cash. Let's get honest. If you're part of that 1%. If you're in the middle, you're screwed. And you're so yeah, what she just said, a couple of things. Before she said, long since gone to cash. If you're the upper 1%, you're long since gone to cash, you pulled out. All right, so there's that one part. The next part, one of the things that she said, uh, she says, you know, if you're a firefighter and, you know, you got a pension, and you're living great, you're living beautifully. Look, I got friends who are firefighters. They're not living that fantastic. They're not living on a mansion <laughs> with a couple, couple million dollar houses. Come on. But the, but the problem is, is a lot of different uh, cities, they have a problem with their pension fund being bankrupt because people dig into that uh, and they shouldn't have. So we see a problem that way. And I can see a problem later on going on with this as far as like pensions getting raided to pay for other programs because the fiscal responsibility has lapsed. And that's the problem. But anyhow, talking about going to cash, let's take a look at one of those people who has a lot of it. So this was an article. Uh, written on March 14, 2020, Warren Buffett is ready to pounce on the stock market massacre. Thing is, Warren Buffett is poised to buy when there's blood in the streets. He, he, of course, is one of the greatest investors of all time, right? And he is sitting right now on $128 billion in spare cash to buy stocks during this downturn. The thing is, though, he hasn't done it yet. So it makes me believe if Warren Buffett who has a lot more experience than I do in this and is probably a hundred times better at time in the stock market than I'll ever be. If he's sitting in the background going, you know what? I'm just going to keep this cash for a bit because it's going to go down lower. Chances are things might go down lower. This is just a assessment. Uh, there could be things going on in the background I don't know about, but if you're sitting on that much money and you haven't made a move yet, I think you're waiting for something bigger. Just don't know what it is, but uh, we will see. Only time will tell. Let's move on. So back to the article, it states the negative impact of uh, the coronavirus on the real economy still looms over the horizon. Unemployment rates are surging so fast that the U.S. Labor Department has actually asked states to postpone the release of their numbers to temper negative market sentiment. Wow. Well, I can just tell you right now that the Department of Labor uh, released the unemployment and it was around the week before it was around 6.6 .6 million now we were creeping up at a plus an additional another six to seven million so we're sitting at around 12 13 14 million or something like that that are unemployed which yes the uh, total population of the united states is 330 million but you can't count everybody because they're not uh, employment status so they, they look at around 150 million or so correct me if i'm wrong i'm sure you will everybody loves to do that uh, so we're looking at around 11, 12% of the population is unemployed right now. And we know what we just saw as far as the articles, as far as the IMF, that will only get worse over time. So we are thinking that it's going to be around 30% unemployed when it's all said and done. And the highest point for the Great Depression was around 25, 26%. So we're going to beat the Great Depression unemployment rates potentially. Uh, I don't see it going any other way, but I mean, it could. It, it could go out fantastic. I just don't see it. Anyhow, moving on. An opportune mo moment for cryptocurrency digital assets. The stimulus package revealed that corporations were woefully unprepared for any type of supply demand shock and had abused low interest loan rates to buy back their own shares. This is what we just talked about. And uh, Delta is a prime example. Within 30 days, that company could not keep itself afloat uh, for an economic downturn, and they were already asking for a handout because they were not financially responsible when they got their 
first stimulus package way back when, and they just went ahead and bought their own stocks. And what did the US government do? They bailed them out again. So for as long as I've been alive, I have heard this model. Maybe you have heard the same thing. Keep an emergency six months cash flow in your bank account in case of a downturn. That way you won't be caught short. Well, if we are expected to do this as just individuals, I believe that big corporations should be also held to the same standard. And if not, there is no way that we should be billing them out again, especially since they screwed us out last time by buying back their own shares to artificially inflate the prices of the stock market. That is just me. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Let me move on. Nonetheless, most corporations are being bailed out along with major fund managers to the tune of the Fed and Treasury Department's 4.25 trillion standing lending facility. In comparison, small businesses are left with a meager 300 billion. And to me, I think this is outrageous. The small businesses get 300 billion out of that 4.25 trillion, while the big businesses get the lion's share of the stimulus. Now, some goes direct to the people. We know that's going to happen. I believe that things are in progress right now in the U.S. And again, I don't know where you're at. Uh, Canada, I heard they are doing great things, um, depending on who I, who who tells me in the comment section. Some can say it's awesome. Some people say it sucks. Uh, Australia, I think the same thing's happening. Europe, same thing's kind of happening. There's a some type of stimulus package. So whatever it is, let me know what's going on in your neck of the woods or in your world and uh, put it in the comment section below. But for us... It is the same song and dance. Uh, we're getting a huge stimulus package, but the lion's share is going to the big businesses, which is just awful. And I think we know who's really benefiting here. And uh, there was this video I watched, and it was just fantastic. I, I have to show it to you. This is by from Shamath. Shamath, he is a ex-Facebook uh, board member. Uh, he is a huge proponent of Bitcoin. I believe he's a billionaire. And uh, he's got on the right track. When he was asked this question by a newscaster in MSNBC, you could just see the, the newscaster was like, what? I mean, it's just kind of like, are, are you, did you say that out loud? So just take a listen to this. This is pretty great. But are, are you suggesting, you keep saying propping up zombie companies. Are, are you, are you arguing to let airlines, for example, fail? Yes. Why? I mean, how? How does that make sense in the broader <laughs> just that guy's face. scheme of, of the economy? Because it's not, because when you look at what it means, this is why I'm saying, like, this is a lie that's been purported by Wall Street. When a company fails, it does not fire their employees. It goes through a packaged bankruptcy, right? If anything, what happens is the people who have the pensions inside those companies, the employees of these companies, end up owning more of the company. The people that get wiped out are the speculators that own the unsecured tranches of debt or the folks that own the equity. And by the way, those are the rules of the game. That's right, because these are the people that purport to be the most sophisticated investors in the world. They deserve to get wiped out. But the employees don't get wiped out. The pensions don't typically get wiped out. Why does anybody, do, I just don't understand, why does anybody deserve, using your word, to get wiped out from a, a, a crisis created like, like this? How does anybody like, deserve to get wiped don't. out? Well, but, but, but just be clear. Like, who are we talking about? We're talking about a hedge fund that serves a bunch of billionaire family offices. Who cares? Let them get wiped out. Who cares? They don't get to summer in the Hamptons. Who cares? I mean, there are people. You, you don't think the employees? Table, on, Scott. You don't if think you the employees of these companies table, own stocks? I mean, own their stocks? Right? Own the company's stocks? You can, you can look on Bloomberg and you can see what percentage of these companies are typically owned by. These, these things are owned by BlackRock. These things are owned by these huge, you know, amorphous organizations. Ultimately, downstream, and the employee owns a few hundred dollars or a few thousand, thousand dollars of shares. I just don't understand. So this is, like, is a, a, could, like a natural disaster. Why does anybody deserve to get wiped out? Wouldn't that be immoral in and of itself? No, because what's happening right now is what I'll tell you is on Main Street today, People are getting wiped out. And right now, rich CEOs are not. Boards that had horrible governance are not. Hedge funds are not. People are. Six million people just this week alone basically saying, holy mackerel, I don't know how I'm going to make pay, you know my own expenses for the next few weeks, days, months. So it's happening today to individual Americans. And what we've done is disproportionately prop up and protect 
you know, poor performing CEOs, companies, and boards. And you have to wash these people out. That's true. You got to wash them all out. And it's just, it's a perfect way to say these types of things. Now, let me be clear. I am not uh, anti-rich person that the rich people are, you know, the uh, source of, of all of our problems and woes and whatnot. It's not the case. I'm just saying that the, the way that things are being done right now, I don't see it as very beneficial. If you can have a corporation, you can have LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, or, or whatever type of corporation you have, let them file bankruptcy, be protected by the bankruptcy courts like he just talked about, and then bail out the people. It doesn't make any sense to me to give a huge stimulus package to these types of uh, huge uh, companies when really it's supposed to go down to the people. You give the, the, the money to the people, trickle down economics, I never have, uh, really agreed with. Uh, but you do that type of thing, and it should work out as far as like what the people actually need. Now, these companies, let them get shaken out, all these types of uh, weak companies that shouldn't be around, that are only propped up by the government. That is not the way to go. And I'll just say it like that. Let's, let's move on. Moving on in the article, it says Bitcoin's safe haven narrative may have taken a hit during the last month, but this is precisely the moment it was created for, and I couldn't agree more. Add in a rising generation of millennial investors who have now watched the legacy system fail spectacularly twice, and the picture of a stark opportunity for crypto to prevail among the public begins to crystallize. And this is how I feel. As time goes on, more people will turn to cryptocurrency digital assets. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's transparent, and overall, it's just a better asset class. Also, Bitcoin has been crushing all their asset classes for the last two to three years, I think even five years. And I know just last year, it beat everything. It beat the S&P 500, it beat oil, it beat gold, everything, hands down. So all these different um, uh, mutual funds and investment planners, do you think after this whole downturn, when the cryptocurrency market didn't tank, but actually was able to rise, they won't be recommending this to their clients? Think again. Anyhow, moving on. Uh, early indications of a positive impact. The shuttering of local businesses has strained employees and small businesses to a tenuous level. Interestingly, cannabis shops have been deemed essential in states like Colorado, highlighting a unique development. And if you don't know, uh, marijuana dispensaries or cannabis shops, they cannot use uh, banks. Uh, let me take a look here. So this is an article back in October 1st, 2019. Underbank cannabis industry struggles to finance double-digit growth, leaving business owners empty-handed. Now, why is this? Though medical recreational use of marijuana is now legal in 33 states, marijuana is still classified as a Schedule One substance under federal law, putting it in the same categories, heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. So for all my viewers out there who are outside of America, that is true. We classify marijuana as the same category as heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. And most financial institutions such as banks, Visa, and MasterCard will not work with the cannabis industry fearing federal prosecution. So what does that mean? That means that every transaction that these uh, dispensaries uh, partake in, somebody walks in, gives money for whatever it is, push, and says, hey, uh, I, this is what I want. Sure, you take it. It all has to be cash. And then they are cash heavy, which opens them up to a lot of problems as far as moving money around. So you know what can fix that? Bitcoin fixes that. Uh, different cryptocurrencies could fix that. It couldn't be just Bitcoin. Uh, we know Bitcoin's not the fastest as far as TPS, but uh, they could use the Lightning Network, for example, and they could be. We could be banking the unbanked. So it's not just the unbanked, like in. Um, Africa and parts of South America is right here in the good old US of A uh, because we have our laws backwards. Anyhow, moving on. Meanwhile, stablecoin supplies are swelling to historic levels. It's hard to pinpoint precisely why, but some observations indicate that either this may be a byproduct of increasing OTC, over-the-counter desk operational demand. Stablecoins are a venue for increasing exposure to the most in-demand asset right now, USD, or people are merely hedging positions in the crypto market. And this is my question to all of you. Is this what's happening? Could major institutions be hedging their bet in crypto? Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I can tell you this, the market did rocket over the last week, uh, cryptocurrency market, so we'll see. Investors surveying the landscape now will likely be impressed with the progress if they had left in early 2018 when SegWit is barely adopted and the hype was untenable. 
Coinbase even revealed that retail investors comprised a bulk of the buyers when the Bitcoin price briefly dipped under 4,000 in mid-March. I read that and I go, what? The retail investors, that's who bought them all up? So I took a look at the blog itself and this is what it states. But beyond just a rush, two things are clear. Customers of our retail brokerage were buyers during the drop and Bitcoin was a clear favorite. So retail investors, retail brokerage, eh, a little different. And uh, we're also seeing people paying brokers and trusts a huge premium just to be a part of this great wealth transfer. So you can take a look here. We've got Grayscale Ethereum Trust is trading at a 515% premium just for people to get their hands on Ethereum. Why would they do this? So it costs $90.55 to buy a share in Grayscale Investments Ethereum Trust. However, it's either holdings per share are currently worth just $16.10. That means it's five times more expensive to buy Ether via the trust than in any other open market. And uh, that's up from 220%, which was in February. So the question I always have was, why do they do that? Well, they're paying premiums to avoid taxes and regulations. The ETH Trust is targeted investors willing to pay more for regulatory oversight and to avoid risk. And what's happening is the fund is also performing the custody so the buyers don't have to do anything. They don't have to have a nano ledger. They don't have to go through Coinbase and buy it, whatever else, which me personally, if I can save myself, you know, 500%, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to do it. And uh, But some of these people have a lot of money. Like, nope, you guys do that. It's fine. And then uh, just not to burst your bubble, but the trust requires all investors to be accredited with a minimum of $25,000 to start. So that's just one aspect as far as like big in investors getting in. But here's another one that I found fascinating. New York Power Plant is selling 30% of its Bitcoin mining hash rate to institutional buyers. So this uh, firm, this is in New York, I believe. Yeah, New York. Uh, upstate New York. The firm said an announcement on Friday that the deal brokered by BitUda Digital, great, perceived the sale of 106,000 terahashes per second of Bitcoin mining power to undisclosed buyers consisting of hedge funds and family offices. The deal would give the buyers a daily yield of about 1.8 Bitcoin worth around $13,000 in addition to having the corresponding hardware pledged as collateral. So uh, these guys just swooped in and go, we want that. We know where this is going. We want to buy everything, even though we know that these mining rigs are going to be obsolete at some point, but they don't care. We, they want them. They're going to take them. And I believe um, this power plant is a hydroelectric power plant in upstate New York. So they're saving tremendous money on uh, electricity costs. I could be wrong. Uh, correct me in the comments section. Let's move on. And finishing off, the point is that Everyone is struggling amid an unprecedented global crisis. From a financial outlook, the situation is favorable for crypto. But first, projects and crypto assets need to weather the economic storm ahead. Then, maybe the infrastructure progress and early indications of blossoming, blossoming adoption will follow. That's true. We just have to get through this trash to get to the promised land. It's just going to be tough. Crypto's foundation is built upon an ever-reducing trust in the legal in the legacy financial system. That system has exposed its faults once again. And while there are still ways to go for the broader crypto industry to appeal to the mainstream, the current macro narrative has been more conducive to the sector's eventual success. Now it's about seeing the opportunity. So that's how I see it too. Right now, I don't care what you say, or I don't, I do care what you say. But I, there are just some people that I have to disagree with. Some people think that we are not early adopters, that we are middle adopters, that everybody knows about Bitcoin. I'm going to tell you, I don't think that's true. I think if you go on the street, you ask people about Bitcoin, yeah, I'm also say it, but ask them about XRP, ask them about Binance coin, ask them about Litecoin. No one knows. So I see it as if we can get people to understand what it is and why it is superior that's when everything starts to move as far as mass adoption. And that's one of the reasons why I created this channel because I was sick and tired of explaining to all my friends and family, like, this is going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And they were just sick and tired of hearing me say it again and again. And I thought I could reach more people through YouTube and it seemed to work out. So that's it for uh, today's story. So I want to say thanks for sticking with me through the rants. Uh, it was a long one, but it was, I think, important. If you got time, I'm going to go through the scam of the day, and it should only take two minutes. So if you got that time, uh, let's do it. So scam of the day. Um, I created this because I was sick of my subscribers getting screwed out of their money by scammers. There's no reason, especially now. If you look in the comment section of any of my videos, it's going to say, 
scam of the day. And you can click on that. It's going to take you to this spreadsheet called scam of the day. And if you scroll all the way down, we've got five left. One, two, three, four, five. And they're all pretty much the same. And what we're going to try to do is get rid of them. So we'll click on the first one here. And they're all, again, these are like pretty much mirror image. They're all the same junk. Um, and what we're doing is trying to get rid of them. So you can't take my word for it. Okay, trust no one. Verify everything. So it, just because I say it's a scam doesn't mean it's a scam. So let's take a look at what I look for. First of all, we're looking for an asymmetrical giveaway. And you can see it right here. Well, if you send me a Bitcoin, I'm going to give you five. If you give me five Bitcoin, I'll give you 25. That's a scam. Then we can take a look at the comment section and it looks pretty scammy. But who knows? Maybe Joseph Masters is just a big hater of Binance it drops, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we can take a look at this and we say, yeah, looks like a scam. No one does this. Now, if you want to be super uh, prudent in your research, you can go to Binance and go, hey, Binance, are you giving away Bitcoin? They're going to tell you no. If you see something with Ripple or you see something with Nano Ledger or if you see someone with Gemini or whatever else is out there, just send them an email to their official website. They'll get back to you pretty quickly and tell you that no, it's a scam. So this one I've already checked with. It is definitely a scam. You can do your own research, of course. So what I want you to do, just down, just dislike it, click on these three dots and just report it. And all you got to do is just click on spam and then uh, one more scams and fraud and then next. Just say it's a scam, scam, and then report. That's all you got to do. So if you can do that, that'd be fantastic. So that's it for today's video. Uh, thanks for watching. If you like these types, leave me two more on the left and right. Not sure which one. It's uh, curated. And that's it. Thanks for sticking with me. See you in the next one. Bye.